All right, I think we'll get started. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the 2002 uh, Gardner Lectures, Minds That Matter. Uh, my name is Rick Wozniak. I'm a professor in the Department of Cell Biology, and I've worked in various capacities for the Gardner Foundation over the past decade or so. And today I will be the MC for the Gardner Lectures. Uh, before I get started, I'd, I'd like to first acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, uh, and we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence in, continues to enrich our vibrant community. As many of you are aware, the uh, Gardner Lectures are an important annual event at the University of Alberta and many universities across Canada. And while we have had to change the format um, uh, for the symposium this year, we are happy to continue to bring it to you virtually today, and we hope you enjoy the event. Uh, I would like to start by thanking various individuals who have contributed to putting this event together. First, uh, I'd like to thank the, the Gardner Foundation, in particular Janet Rassant, who's president and scientific director of the Gardner Foundation. Kelty Reed is an advisor in communications and fund development for their assistance in making this day possible. I would also like to thank various members of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry here at the U of A uh, for their input and assistance in putting together this event, including Dean Hamilton, uh, Vice Dean of Research Richard Lenner, Associate Dean of Research Greg Funk, uh, who has helped a lot with putting together a afternoon session with students of, and the speakers. And I would also like to thank uh, doctors uh, Armin Gamper and Sue Sai for providing introductions uh, of today's speakers. Uh, importantly, special thanks go to Emily Hoffman. Uh, she's a coordinator in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, and she's really the critical figure in overseeing all of today's events and making sure that um, the events run smoothly. Uh, finally, I, I'd like to stress the important financial contributions of the Gardner Foundation, the governments of Canada and Alberta, CIHR, uh, and the Globe and Mail uh, for today's events. Now, at this point, I would like to invite uh, Terrell, uh, who has worked for many years with the Gardner Foundation, to say a few words about the foundation and its important uh, work that it does. Uh, Lauren? Thank you very much, uh, Rick. I have the privilege of saying a few words about the Gardner Foundation, which I served as the Chairman of the Board from 2009 to 2019. Mr. James Gairdner was born in 1893 and was a remarkable man. He was a very good scholar, a distinguished track and field athlete, a veteran of uh, World War I, where he rose to the rank of major. In 1921, he began a new career in investment business and soon became a successful stockbroker and industrialist. He always admired for his integrity and his determination. Unfortunately, he developed severe arthritis in 19, uh, at age 56. Throughout his life, James Gardner showed a particular interest in medicine and medical research. This led him to the conviction that achievements in medical science should be recognized in a tangible way. And in 1957, he established the Gardner Foundation, which two years later began giving its awards. Each year since 1959, awards have been given to medical scientists from many different countries in the world. The purpose of the Gardner Foundation was defined by James Gardner as the following. It will be the function of this foundation to provide prizes as reward to those in the medical world who through their unselfish devotion of time and effort have been successful in making major contributions to research in the conquest of disease and the relief of human suffering, and as an incentive to those who follow in their footsteps to even greater effort. It is extremely important that James Gardner wanted these Canadian awards to recognize the top international achievements in medical research for scientists from anywhere in the world. This clearly distinguishes the Gardner Awards from many other Canadian awards 
as this is the only Canadian award that recognizes the top international uh, achievements. The Gardner Foundation has a wonderful record of making awards to individuals who later go on to win Nobel Prizes. And this year is no exception. 95 people who run recent, uh, have run recent Nobel Prizes have received a Gardner Prize before they won their Nobel Prize. This year includes Nobel winners for chemistry, was shared by two women for the first time ever um, for their work with CRISPR-Cas9, Manuel Caparce and Jennifer Dado. Uh, also this year, the award in medicine and physiology uh, recognized Harvey Alter, who received his Gardner Award in, 19, uh, in 2013. He won the award in medicine and physiology along with Michael Houghton and Charlie Rice from Rockefeller, Mike Houghton from the U of A. Each year in the third week of October, we have a truly remarkable celebration of science across Canada. Former and current award winners normally travel to many cities across the country. Despite COVID this year, there are many Gardner celebrations being held in Canadian cities. <clears throat> I just want to say that in 2008, the Gairdner Foundation received $2 million from the Alberta government to sponsor events in this province and Edmonton, Calgary, and Lethbridge. And I want to also acknowledge particularly the Canadian government who gave a donation of $20 million on the 50th anniversary that has allowed the Gairdner uh, Foundation and these awards to continue lifelong in Canada. I just want to say thank you for attending. This is a celebration of science that everybody recognizes in Canada. Back to you, Rick. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, so to move on, I, I, we have the really great pleasure this year to welcome uh, to our program two uh, Gardner laureates, uh, Dr. Jeff Ravitch from the University of New York and a recipient of the 2012 uh, Canadian Gairder International Award, uh, and Dr. Bruce Stillman from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, and recipient of the 2019 uh, Canadian Gairder International Award. Now our program will include 40-minute uh, presentations by each laureate, followed by a question and answer session. Uh, during the, the Q&A, we'll ask you to raise your hand electronically and once you're recognized by the host, we, you can unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask your questions. Uh, please note um, everyone that the webinar is being recorded uh, and it'll also be available after the event if you have anyone that would like to, to see it. So at this point, um, I'd like to um, get us started with the afternoon's uh, agenda and I'd like to invite Dr. Sue Sai, uh, an assistant professor from the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology to introduce Dr. Ravitch, who will be our first speaker. Sue. Thank you, Rick. Hi, everyone. I have the privilege to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Jeffrey Ravitch. His discoveries of the FC receptors and how their regulation um, and their regulations of B cell functions have really transformed the B cell uh, biology field with important implications in the development of vaccines and immunotherapies for a broad range of human diseases. Like all of us, uh, Dr. Ravitch started his research career as a trainee. During his undergraduate years at Yale, he did some RNA work and ended up publishing his very first author, uh, article from that work. I also worked with RNA myself as an undergraduate, although uh, no papers came out of that one. Dr. Ravitch then did a very productive PhD on bacterial and phage genetics in Rockefeller University, and also he got a medical degree from Cornell University. During his postdoc, Dr. Ravitch uh, went on to work with B cells in, at NIH with Dr. Philip Lader, where he uh, began doing some work with um, the genetics of antibodies and the DNA elements involved in class-rich recombination. 
1982, Dr. Ravitch joined the faculty of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Cancer Center. And since 1996, he was appointed a professor at Rockefeller University. We are here today because Dr. Ravitch is the recipient of the very prestigious Canada Gartner International Award. His work is also recognized by some of the other top international awards in medical science, including the Robert Koch Award, the Wolf Prize in Medicine, and the Sanofi Pasteur Award, among many, many others. Dr. Ravitch has published more than 260 uh, super high impact journal articles that broadly span the fields of infection and immunity. Dr. Ravitch, we are excited to have you here with us today um, to talk about some of these groundbreaking discoveries. Thank you so much, Sue. It's a pleasure being back in the Gairdner uh, week honoring science and scientific accomplishments. Uh, this is my eighth year, I believe, visiting various Canadian cities and universities. And it's always a pleasure to meet the students and faculty and talk about the work. So I guess I can begin by Introducing uh, the topic that I'd like to talk about uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, which are antibodies and their receptors. Uh, I think we're all very sensitive these days about the importance of antibodies in medical research and medical discoveries, particularly because we're now living through a once in a century pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see from this slide, this is a truly global crisis that has uh, enveloped the world. Um, tens of millions of cases will, I'm certain, be recorded before the pandemic is uh, under control with untold numbers of uh, death and long-term morbidity uh, from this uh, viral disease. The opportunities for mitigation are focused on antibodies. And I'm sure you've all seen and heard uh, endless press, press releases, um, breathless announcements of new approaches. And they all center on this one general phenomenon, which is the notion that antibodies can provide protective uh, activity by a process that's called neutralization. And quite simply, it means that the antibody by engaging a specific molecule on the envelope of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the uh, spike protein, the S protein, prevents it from engaging its receptor on a human cell, the ACE2 receptor, and thereby thwarts the process of infection, uh, entry, replication, and disease uh, proliferation. I think it's worthwhile at this moment to kind of take a bit of a break and look back at the history of how this concept really came about. And this is certainly not a new phenomenon. Antibodies as therapeutics for the treatment of infectious diseases dates back to the end of the 19th century when doctors Emil von Behring and Shisaburo Kitasato, working in the Robert Koch Institute, were the ones who first described the phenomenon whereby you could transfer protection and immunity to animals using a cell-free blood product that uh, was directed against the toxins produced by either diphtheria or tetanus, and thereby protect these animals from a potentially lethal disease. This blood free, uh, sorry, the cell free blood fluid, uh, in fact, was the antitoxins, or we now call them antibodies. And within a few years, by 1894, antitoxins were widely being used as immunotherapeutics. This slide shows a preparation of diphtheria antitoxin that was pre prepared in New York City at the Staten Island clinical laboratories by immunizing horses with 
purified uh, diphtheria toxin and harvesting the horse serum as a, uh, as a treatment modality. As you can see from the right-hand side of this slide, when this antitoxin was introduced into treatment of individuals who were either at risk of developing a diphtherial a disease or were already infected, there was a dramatic decrease in mortality. Within a decade, the mortality rate decreased by over 70% by the introduction of uh, antitoxins or antibodies for an infectious disease. This was truly a milestone in medical uh, development and presaged the importance of immunotherapies. So the question of course is, do antibodies uh, to COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 uh, act as effective therapeutics for either prevention or treatment of disease? And I've just taken one slide from a recent publication uh, in Science that was published a few weeks ago, showing a cocktail of two antibodies, two monoclonal antibodies, developed by the company Regeneron. One was uh, isolated from a convalescent patient who recovered from COVID-19, and the other was developed uh, as a result of immunizing mice that had human antibody genes. And both antibodies as a cocktail, as you could see when used in a hamster model of COVID-19 infection, provided both prophylactic as well as some degree of treatment efficacy in these uh, models. And as a basis of those kinds of studies, uh, there are now quite a few clinical studies evaluating cocktails of anti-SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibodies for either uh, post-exposure prophylaxis or uh, immunotherapeutic intervention. And many are now entering phase three studies uh, with uh, the likelihood of emergency use authorization um, being authorized by various agencies around the world for the use of these antibodies. It does raise a question, of course, of how do antibodies mediate protection from microbial pathogens? And this is a problem that has kind of vexed the field from the very beginning. Paul Ehrlich at the turn of the 19th century, 20th century, uh, in a lecture he delivered in uh, Cambridge, England, the Kuhnian lecture in 1900, on the right-hand side, depicted what he thought was a mechanism by which his antitoxins, or as we call them now, antibodies, engaged the uh, body's defenses to provide protection. And while the figure is not labeled, I've taken the liberty of introducing my own labels to this figure. Um, the antigen shown as the uh, black substance engages a specific domain on the antitoxin, which we would call the FAB. And what was remarkably prescient of Paul Ehrlich and still amazes me every time I look at this uh, slide, he depicted a second side of the antibody, the other end of the antibody molecule, which we would call the FC, engaging a molecule on the surface of a cell of the immune system which as you'll hear today is an FC receptor. So that the antibody was not acting solely to engage the antigen, but was coupling antigen recognition to cellular responses. And that theoretical construct has been one that I've been obsessed with for the past three decades. And in fact have um, demonstrated, I think that Ehrlich was spot on in his analysis, right? So, what is an antibody? Well, of course, we all understand the structure of an antibody. The classical view of the antibody shows the uh, domains here in uh, blue, which are the variable domains where antibodies have the remarkable specificity to recognize essentially unlimited antigenic determinants. It has a relatively invariant domain called the constant region, which is the FC domain, which as you can see from this structure has a uh, dimeric composition with a density found between the two chains, which you'll hear much more about. It's a, a complex biantenary glycan. And the question that we tried to address in my work was, what is the role of the FC in the mechanism by which antibodies provide their biological function? 
So coming back to our uh, question of antibody neutralization and SARS-CoV-2, for example, to remind you that neutralization is defined as an in vitro assay. It's the ability of an antibody to bind to a foreign antigen and block or neutralize its biological function. So it targets epitopes on viral domains that are involved in virus entry, fusion, maturation, or release of the virus. And the methods of assessment are really quite simple. An antibody or its FAB domain, a cell line that can uh, be infected by a virus through a, a receptor for viral entry and the virus itself, and shown here are two examples on the left for HIV, on the right for influenza. Antibodies, these are all monoclonals, have different degrees of neutralization capacity. It can range over several logs of potency uh, and it highlights the uh, capacity of these antibodies to uh, demonstrate the so-called neutralization activity. So the question of course is, is neutralization sufficient for protection? Well, how does neutralization potentially work? And I've taken uh, some images uh, from the uh, internet to demonstrate that antibodies, for example, in uh, the case of the number one mechanism are blocking viral entry by binding to specific receptors on HIV um, or on the flu virus, preventing their binding to their cellular receptors or through uh, inhibition of fusion or maturation are able to disrupt the process by which an antibody can infect the cell, propagate and release its progeny virion particles. Clearly, these are significant mechanisms by which antibodies can mediate biological function. But the question is, are they sufficient for in vivo protection? So to address that question, several years ago, my lab began to look at classes of antibodies using the influenza spike protein shown here as a trimeric structure which a, with a globular head domain, which as I'm sure you all know, constantly uh, mutates and evolves. It's why we require uh, seasonal flu vaccines. The virus escapes from its uh, immune selection, requiring uh, new uh, vaccine preparations each year. And it conserves stalk, stalk domain. The head domain is involved in viral entry by attachment to sialic acid, and the soft domain is involved in infusion of the uh, virus to the cellular membrane. A series of monoclonal antibodies were developed by several groups around the world that targeted specific epitopes on the viral head um, that were able to neutralize the virus, and I showed you some of those curves in the previous slide. And these are strain-specific, meaning they only recognize the specific amino acid sequences from that particular seasonal flu vac, uh, um, episode. In contrast, the stalk domain, which is relatively conserved, series of monoclonal antibodies where these antibodies are broadly reactive against uh, viruses that are isolated from different uh, viral isolates from different uh, periods of time. So do these antibodies provide protection from a lethal respiratory infection in mice in vivo. Uh, and as you can see, using two of these uh, anti-head antibodies, PY102 and 7B2 monoclonals, we find that the uh, survival of animals treated with these antibodies at this particular dosing in the experiment uh, was not affected by whether or not we change the FC domain on these antibodies. So what we do is we take the FAB for these antibodies and we put on a uh, different mouse FC domain based on the mouse subclasses, the G1 domain, the G2A domain, or an FC mutant, which we call DA265, which is a mouse G1 mutated in a single amino acid residue that prevents effective function engagement. And what we find is that the, all the antibodies behave essentially the same, saying that, in fact, in this situation, the anti-head antibodies neutralize in vitro and protect in vivo in a manner which is solely dependent upon engagement by the FAB of the antibody. But the situation for the stalk antibodies was strikingly different. Here, two stalk antibodies from the same experimental design um, are shown to have vastly different effects when you change the FC domain. Antibodies that have a IgG2A domain of the mouse, 
uh, are able to protect the animals completely from this lethal flu infection. While the same FAB when coupled to a mouse G1 or to our FC variant, DA265, are ineffective. They're no better than PBS from protecting the mice against lethal infection. So clearly these antibodies rely not only on their ability to engage the stalk domain, but they have to couple that binding specificity to effector pathways. And what are these effector pathways? Well, this next slide demonstrates some of the mechanisms that we deduced for how antibody FC interactions are involved in protection from a viral infection like flu or HIV or Ebola, for example. Uh, on the left-hand panel, starting in panel A, we see that a virus that is uh, coated with antibody can engage a variety of effector cells of the innate immune system, the NK cell, the neutrophil, or the macrophage. And in so doing, they're able to uh, trigger what we would refer to as uh, phagocytosis or opsonization. And these mechanisms are shown on the next slide. You could also engage the viral particles or viral proteins that are expressed on the infected cell and kill these cells or eliminate them through a phagocytic mechanism. These are two innate pathways. The third pathway is more of an adaptive pathway. It's a pathway by which the immune complexes that are generated by killing of an infected cell or opsonizing a virion particle can directly engage uh, dendritic cells leading to the stimulation of naive T cells into effector T cells and ultimately to memory T cells to provide a long-term CD8 memory response. All of these pathways work together to mediate the in vivo protection seen by an antibody that requires effector function for its in vivo activity. So we've done this now for a variety of different pathogens. This slide summarizes uh, quite a bit of work from many different uh, postdocs in the lab. I've shown you the flu data. The same is true for the uh, anthrax toxin, that uh, the lethal uh, toxin of anthrax antibody protection requires FC receptor engagement. If the FCs can't engage, the animals are not protected from this lethal infection. In the case of Ebola, we see there is a, a variation in the degree of protection that can be achieved by changing FC interactions. And the same is true for HIV in a model of uh, chronic infection in uh, macaques or in uh, mice as well, where, I'm sorry, the protection is uh, enhanced when we enhance the ability of the FC domain to engage specific innate effective pathways. So how about the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies? Uh, and this was a study which was just recently uh, completed. Uh, that's now, I believe, in press in the Journal of Experimental Medicine. The study done in collaboration with Ralph Barrick, uh, world expert on coronaviruses. They had developed a mouse adapted SARS-CoV-2 strain. SARS-CoV-2 will not infect uh, the mouse because the ACE2 receptor has uh, diverged from the receptor in human, but a mouse adapted CoV-2 strain will in fact infect these mice. So what, what he did in this study is to compare in vitro neutralization shown on the left for these various antibodies that have been developed from a variety of patients who were recovering from COVID-19 infection. And as you can see from these neutralization curves, there's a significant difference in the neutralizing potencies. They can range over several logs of a neutralization uh, potency in vitro. And then in vivo, one can ask what happens to the ability of these antibodies to protect animals from the uh, mouse adapted virus. And here what we're doing is measuring the number of uh, PFUs or plaque forming units in the lungs of mice that were in infected with the uh, virus after they had been prophylactically treated with the antibodies. And what came out as quite a surprise to some, but not to all of us, was the notion that there was no simple correlation between in vitro neutralization and in vivo potency. In other words, uh, an antibody like C002, which is shown here in this uh, yellow curve, is quite potent in vitro to neutralize, 
but shows much less potency in vivo. In contrast, C104, which shows less potency in vitro, is in fact able to provide sterilizing immunity in vivo. And we saw the same for several other antibodies in these collections. Uh, so what it says of, is that the in vitro assay does not necessarily predict in vivo protection from infection. We can take that a bit further and ask, do the antibodies show dependence on their FC engagement? And once again, we're now looking at the C002 or C104 antibodies, which show quite different degrees of in vitro protection. Uh, but in vivo, as I said, C102 show 002 shows a little degree of protection, while 104 is quite protective. If we mutate the FC of C104, so it can no longer engage effector cells through their receptors, we see a dramatic decrease in the potency. And the same holds true for C110. While C002 has no FC dependence, its uh, in vitro potency, although quite uh, significant, is quite attenuated in vivo, and that is not the result of any FC engagement. So these antibodies are demonstrating properties similar to what we've seen for other antiviral antibodies. Some show dependence on FC effector functions, others do not. And the most potent in vivo assays are the ones that couple both uh, neutralization and in vivo effector uh, activity. So to kind of drive that point home, we took the C104 antibody, which was a modestly protective antibody uh, in, in vitro, and modify the FC by putting on different mouse uh, FC domains, the G1, the G2A, or the mutant G265A. And what you can see is once again, that the G2A is the most potent, meaning that different effector functions are specific for different FC domains. So we have examples in, in the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that mimic everything else we've seen, that an antibody does indeed have two ends, and both are important for providing in vivo protective activity. Well, what other immune responses can we attribute to antibodies beyond their ability to bind through their FAV and provide uh, neutralizing uh, activity? Well, once again, going back to uh, Ehrlich, uh, he postulated that antibodies can provide a mechanism by which we can tolerate against generating autoantibodies, or we call them autotoxins, that would be potentially uh, harmful to the hosts and give rise to autoimmune diseases. Uh, while Ehrlich was certainly correct that autoantibodies would give rise to an autoimmune disease and that a tolerance mechanism must exist to prevent that from occurring, the reality was that 50 years later, Henry Kunkel demonstrated that in fact, autoantibodies do occur uh, in the disease lupus, for example, anti-DNA antibodies, and their deposition as immune complexes will trigger glomerulonephritis and the inflammatory diseases that are now well known in the autoimmune uh, categories. We also found that in the 1980s, work done by uh, Imbach, that antibodies could be, in fact, regulators of the immune system as well. And that came from a clinical observation that high doses of IgG itself in the form of a preparation called intravenous gamma globulin could be used to treat patients with autoimmune disease and reverse their immune diseases. So it told us that antibodies had a variety of activities. They were involved in effector responses. They were involved in protective responses, they were involved in pathogenic responses, they were involved in immunomodulatory responses. And I've summarized you know, some of the activities that we can attribute through their FC domain to uh, the antibody function. On the left, we see the so-called innate functions of antibodies engaging uh, leukocytes to inhibit their activity or stimulate through cellular cytotoxicity and phagocytosis and going to the right-hand side where they modulate the adaptive immune response by engaging dendritic cells, modulating B cell responses, uh, and in fact can uh, also modulate T cell responses through dendritic cell T cell axes. Well, this provided something of a dilemma for us. 
because historically the FC domain is considered invariant. It's a constant domain, it's monomorphic. It doesn't have a diversity of structure the way the FAB does. And therefore mediating these wildly different biological activities seemed uh, somewhat counterintuitive. So the first thing we had to do is demonstrate that the FC domain is in fact structurally diverse. Its diversity comes from a variety of interesting pathways. We know about the subclasses, of course, there are four subclasses. Um, that was actually first described back in the 60s by uh, several groups, including Henry Kunkel's group, demonstrating that the IgG classes existed in different uh, uh, subclasses. We know about so-called alleles or allotypes of these subclasses that differ between the different uh, subclasses. But by and away, the largest driver of diversification is this complex biantenary glycan that's found on the CH2 domain of all IgGs from every species characterized to date. When you simply combine these various drivers of diversification, you can come up to over a thousand different FC variants for any one variable region. So the diversification is present in the FC as we generated in our serum. How does that translate into diversification of function? Well, that requires specific receptors. And these are the FC receptors that uh, I've spent my career characterizing. I've shown the scheme for the human type one FC receptors, members of the IG super family. These are receptors that are immune tyrosine activation motif receptors in green or an immune inhibitory receptor with a cytoplasmic domain with this ITIM motif in red. And these receptors are expressed differentially on different cellular populations, normally in pairs of activating and inhibitory receptors as an important means of setting thresholds. Much more recently, we described the second class of receptors we call the type two receptors, members of the C-type lectin family. These are expressed on cells that modulate the immune response, including B cells and dendritic cells. And they're sensitive to the changes in glycan composition of the FC domain itself. So coupling a diversification of FCs to a diversity of receptors allows us to generate functional diversity. And that's what this uh, simple uh, notion that subclasses and glycan composition can result in selective FC receptor binding. Let me show you some examples of that. So I told you how different mouse subclasses had different in vivo biological activity in our in vivo protection for uh, COVID-2 antibodies or antibodies against flu. And that's because the mouse subclasses have been genetically fixed during their evolution to have preferential binding to different receptors. The mouse G1 subclass preferentially engages the inhibitory FC receptor, poorly engaging activating receptors, while the mouse 2A subclass preferentially engages activating receptors and weakly engages the inhibitory receptor. We found that a simple uh, calculation of the uh, affinity constants for the activating to the inhibitory receptors demonstrated almost a three log difference between these two subclasses of receptors. So that if you do the experiment I told you before, but now use a mouse tumor model, metastatic melanoma model to the mouse lung, treat these mice with a monoclonal antibody that targets melanoma cells, you can see quite dramatically on the bottom panel that the G1 subclass is not able to mitigate the uh, metastatic nodules, while the 2A subclass is essentially curative and the 2B subclass falls in the middle. And these correlate very nicely with the AI ratios or their ability to engage activating in contrast to inhibitory receptors. So the first level of diversification subclass can in fact drive quite specific FC receptor engagement and thereby specific in vivo activity. The glycan on the other hand has a much more subtle effect on the FC structure. Here I'm showing a uh, animation of what happens when you selectively uh, reduce the composition of the glycan by deleting individual sugars until you're completely aglycosylated. And what you see is that the spacing between the A and B chains of the dimeric FC starts to collapse. That's significant because the type one receptors are engaging the FC 
in the groove formed by the A and B chain that's held in an open conformation by the glycan itself. So glycosylation in principle has the ability to modulate the FC structure, but it actually goes beyond that. The glycan has specific sugar residues that will influence specific FC receptor binding. So the presence or absence of a branching fucose residue that is attached to the n glucosamine on the complex biantennary glycan will in fact modulate binding to an activating receptor by about a factor of 10 or so. And that translates into a more pro-inflammatory antibody when the fucose is missing, increasing cytotoxicity. Fucosylation is in fact regulated in vivo during a variety of inflammatory responses, including during uh, viral infection as antibody responses are skewing to a more pro-inflammatory status. In contrast, the presence or absence of sialic acid as a terminal sugar reduces binding affinity to the type one receptors and allows the FC to acquire the ability to engage the type two FC receptors. And the consequence of that is to reduce the inflammatory response. And it's the basis for why IVIG can be anti-inflammatory. It's because 10% or so of that preparation has silated IgG, and that silated IgG is in fact the anti-inflammatory component. It's a natural mechanism the body uh, uses to prevent high concentrations of circulating IgG from inappropriately activating inflammatory cells. So we can summarize all this information into a, a simple schematic where the type one receptors are engaging the FC in a one-to-one -one complex driven through the intercalation of the FC and the FC receptor into that groove, while the type two receptors engage in a uh, two to one complex, allowing for a uh, multiplization of the receptor uh, ligand complexes and demonstrating mutual exclusivity of these two receptor pathways. Right, so I'd like to kind of conclude by giving some concrete examples of how the knowledge of these FC receptor pathways and specific FC modifications can in fact drive the development of improved therapeutic antibodies. And we'll start with cellular cytotoxicity and then move on to uh, various uh, T cell responses. So our first indication that antibodies mediated cellular cytotoxicity and therapeutic indications came from the introduction of therapeutic antibodies for the treatment of uh, both lymphoma on the right-hand side with the rituximab or uh, metastatic breast carcinoma with the introduction of Herceptin. And these antibodies followed about 100 years after von Behring and Kitasato's antibodies were first introduced into clinical medicine for the treatment of diphtheria and tetanus respectively. These antibodies we then demonstrated by looking at animal models where FC receptors were now deleted, the gamma chain knockout, were dependent upon these receptors for their in vivo therapeutic activity. In this case, you could see the lymphoma growing in this animal, treated with the antibody, lymphoma disappears, the mouse lacks these FC receptors, activating receptors, the lymphomas grow despite the presence of therapeutic levels of the antibody. In the case of Herceptin, it's quite similar, even though the antibody is quite effective in vitro in inhibiting the growth of tumor cells, breast carcinoma cells, by virtue of blocking a growth factor pathway. In vivo, these antibodies work by cytotoxic mechanisms because if you delete the ability to uh, bind to FC receptors, as shown in this lower right-hand panel, tumors grow despite their in vitro capacity to modulate tumor growth. So in vivo, cytotoxicity was a dominant pathway. And this was confirmed by patient studies that were done by several groups, including Ron Levy's group, where he looked at patients who were being treated with these antibodies, either the anti-CD20 for lymphoma or the anti-HER2 new for metastatic carcinoma, and noticed that patients' response correlated with specific alleles of activating FC receptors. If the patients had a higher binding allele, they had a longer survival in both cases compared to those patients that had a more weakly binding allele. And therefore, the ability to engage an FC receptor was critical for the therapeutic activity of these antibodies. This led in a direct fashion to the development of second generation 
rituximab molecules, where the FC is modified by glycan engineering to provide for improved binding to the activating FC receptor. And that's this lower light blue line, the antibody is called obituzumab. It was approved several years ago by the FDA. And you compare it to its parent rituximab, and you can see about a year enhanced survival for patients who were treated with this in combination with uh, chemotherapy. So that clearly enhancing cytotoxic activity of the antibody was in fact a significant therapeutic modality. So tumor killing by antibodies through their FC receptors, kind of reminiscent of what I showed you for the clearance of virus or virally infected cells. That the antibody is engaging the tumor cell through its FAB domains, but it's the coupling to the effector cells, the NK cells, the macrophages, the granulocytes through their specific FC receptors that leads to the cytotoxic effect. But once again, in principle, the generation of immune complexes could feed back on dendritic cells to lead to the activation of these cells and the conversion of naive T cells to CD8 cytotoxic cells. And we saw that in a variety of mouse models where when we generated uh, antibodies that selectively engaged activating receptors on dendritic cells, we could drive dendritic cells to a state that we call the mature dendritic cell. This was an observation uh, that we made together with Ralph Steinman, who recognized that dendritic cells, uh, as they normally circulated, were in a, uh, an, an immature state. They were not activated to, uh, to induce CD8 uh, effector cell responses. They needed second signals to lead to that maturation. And one such second signal that we could provide was the immune complex, but it had to engage the activating receptor and not the inhibitory receptor. When it did that, we were able to differentiate these cells and lead to enhanced T cell exc uh, uh, excitation. And the mechanism is basically summarized here for antibodies against CD20 that were engineered for this so-called T cell or vaccinal effect. They act like a vaccine before because the antibodies initially kill the tumor cell by innate responses. Those tumor cells then release immune complexes that then if they engage the activating receptor on the immature dendritic cell, lead to the maturation of that cell, upregulation of the class two MHC, the uh, ligands for CD28, and that drives the immature T cell to the T effector cell and ultimately to the T memory cell response. So that principle actually was applied in the development of a second generation Herceptin molecule where the FC was modified uh, by a group at Macrogenics. And what they did was modify the FC so that it engaged not only the activating receptor but had reduced binding to an inhibitory receptor, thereby skewing the ratio of activating to inhibitory receptor. And they found in the dark blue line that patients treated with that combination had in fact an improved survival over patients that were treated with the um, parent antibody um, Herceptin or Trasituzumab. So you can induce CD8 cells in these patients by engaging through activating receptors dendritic cell pathways. The same is true in the antiviral response. In a study we just recently published in the last week or so, we demonstrate that that anti-flu response that we talked about, antibodies that target the stalk domain of the uh, of the uh, HA protein. When the FC is modified to specifically engage the uh, activating receptor on dendritic cells, shown here is the GA variant or the GALI variant. Those uh, animals that are treated have enhanced protective activity, and that protection is the result of the induction of a CD8 response. And that comes back to our notion that it's not just coupling to innate responses, but it's feeding back on the adaptive response that's key to the mechanism by which these antibodies are able to induce protection. This is a general principle. It's been seen by other groups in the treatment of uh, chronically infected monkeys being treated with antibodies uh, for HIV. Uh, these are shiv infected uh, macaques, and some of these uh, macaques will demonstrate long-term survival uh, despite the uh, lack of antibody treatment. So one treatment dose 
led to a long-term survival. If you deplete CD8 cells from these animals, you see recurrence of their viremia, which then comes back down again as CD8 cells are, are replenished. So inducing adaptive responses or a vaccinal response is really the, the goal for antibody treatments, not simply to provide short-term protection, but to actually provide what would be a vaccinal effect for long-term survival. So how can we induce cytotoxic T cells? I showed you the immune complexes can activate dendritic cells and lead to CD8 cell responses. Of course, we know about the ability to block inhibitory signaling, so-called checkpoint blockade uh, work from Jim Allison, uh, a Gairdner recipient as well, uh, demonstrating CTLA-4 blockade can lead to induction of CD8 uh, effector responses, as well as the stimulation of agonistic signals uh, in the immune response. And this slide summarizes lots of potential pathways that can be engaged. Uh, and note all, in all these cases that these cartoons only are based on FAB engagement. FABs either engage uh, inhibitory receptors like PD-1 and CTLA-4 or activating receptors like CD-40 to drive a uh, anti-tumor response by cueing the CD8 response to occur. The question, of course, we wanted to address was, is that all there is, or does EFC contribute to this activity? So in studies that we began quite a few years ago now, on the left-hand side, we looked at anti-CTLA-4 antibodies in a mouse model of uh, melanoma, and we demonstrated that the protective activity of an anti-CTLA-4 antibody in the solid blue line was completely abrogated if the mice lacked activating receptors. And that's because what the antibody was doing was not simply blocking inhibitory signaling, but in fact was killing T regulatory cells that were critical for the survival of these tumors by a mechanism that relied upon FC receptor mediated killing. The same is true on the right hand side for anti PDL1. When it, uh, its FC was modified, we lost its protective activity as well. The FC was providing the ability to deplete various myeloid suppressor cells that were contributing to the survival of these tumors. So we decided to focus on the activating receptor CD40, which was a very promising candidate for how we can induce a uh, immune response that would end up killing a tumor cell. CD40 is expressed on macrophages, on dendritic cells, on B cells, and agonizing these pathways could lead to the generation of anti-tumor antibodies, NK cells and neutrophils, or activated CD8 cells that could all act together to kill the cancer cell. Despite this potent uh, potential in various animal models, the in vivo situation was quite disappointing. The antibodies that were developed uh, by a variety of companies were quite toxic and had very little therapeutic activity, which led us to wonder if something was wrong with the antibody. And since uh, we look at the world through the FC, could the FC be in fact uh, required for how agonistic anti-CD40 antibodies behaved. And this is a simple experiment where we looked once again at uh, a, a anti-CD40 antibody response in vivo, measuring CD8 activation as our readout in vivo, looking at the uh, changes that occur when we modify the mouse background to either lack an inhibitory receptor or lack an activating receptor. I think you can see a dramatic difference. If there's no inhibitory receptor, the antibody was unable to mediate its biological activity of inducing CD8 responses. And that's because CD40, a member of the TNF receptor superfamily, is a trimeric receptor. Its ligand is trimeric. The normal interactions shown here are trimer to trimer engagement that leads to the agonistic signal. Antibodies at best can dimerize, and that will not give an agonistic signal. So you need to have an FC acting as a cross-linking agent to dimerize, to multimerize the uh, receptor to trigger a agonistic signal. The therapeutic antibodies that had been developed were of the mouse, the human IgG2 class, which are quite weak at binding the inhibitory FC receptor. So we re-engineer those antibodies to introduce into the FC of that antibody a potent ART inhibitory receptor binding signal. 
And we use the inhibitory receptor because we don't want to kill the cell that we're trying to agonize. We simply want to have a scaffold to cross like. And when we did that and compared the activity now in vivo in a variety of tumor models, what you could see, the, uh, the light green line is the parent antibody and the uh, purple line is the same parent antibody with the FC modified to enhance inhibitory binding. You see significant reduction in the uh, tumor growth in the colon carcinoma MC38 model, as well as in a, in a B16 metastatic melanoma line a model where the, the enhanced V11 antibody essentially obliterates the tumors compared to the parent antibody, which is a G2, and here's the control. So we can certainly enhance the antitumor activity of a therapeutic antibody by understanding the mechanism of how it works in vivo and optimizing that mechanism, but it came with a dark side. It came with the fact that we enhance the efficacy, we also enhance the toxicity because CD40 is also expressed on human platelets. And by cross-linking CD40 on platelets, we lead to thrombotic events, thromboemboli in the liver that lead to necrotic uh, uh, regions and liver toxicity. So can we in fact find a way to achieve anti-tumor activity without systemic toxicity? And that's where the immune system really has its greatest strength because the immune system is not a localized system, it's a disseminated system. We can target one location activate an immune response that will disseminate throughout the entire organism. That's how vaccines work. That's how many therapeutics work. So our reasoning was rather than treat the patient systemically by IV, for example, with our anti-CD40 that will give you systemic side effects, why not inject a single tumor directly, activate the local immune response at that tumor site, and those activated T cells would then migrate out of the tumor location find other distal tumor sites and lead to tumor killing. And that activity is called the abscopal effect. So here's an example of that experiment. We implant two tumors on a mouse, both are MC38 colon carcinoma. We inject one of the tumors at a dose that is far below the, uh, the maximum tolerated dose for systemic toxicity. You can look at the liver enzymes on the upper right-hand panel. There's no change in their uh, liver uh, enzyme activity. There's no evidence of thrombotic events. The injected tumor in red shows good tumor re uh, regression. The non-injected tumor begins to regress as well. And the overall tumor size of both tumors now is quite low. If you compare that to introducing that same concentration systemically, you see there's no control. So one can in fact inject locally and have a a generalized effect. And this is the basis for a clinical trial that we're now uh, in progress at the Rockefeller University Hospital. Finally, other tumors can also be treated this way. Bladder cancer is one example where direct access to the tumor is available because you can instill the drug into the bladder directly. It's called intravesical delivery of the tumor. And here is a, an example of comparing the uh, current standard of care, which is the BCG vaccine to stimulate an immune response in this uh, animal model of bladder cancer. You can see there's really very little uh, change in the animal's ability to uh, prevent premature mortality from this tumor compared to the anti-CD40, which has been optimized for its agonistic activity where we see significant survival. Uh, and you can see that also by measuring just the uh, local tumor effects compared to BCG. So I'm going to end by simply summarizing that knowledge of FC receptor function has resulted in development of a new classes of therapeutics, antibody, uh, very small molecules that inhibit signaling of FC receptors for autoimmune diseases, many engineered FC antibodies for enhanced cytotoxicity that have been approved, lots of them that are now in late stage clinical trials, and the most recent generation of uh, antibodies for infectious diseases, like the CoV-2 antibodies, flu antibodies that are being engineered for FC effector activity. And with that, I'd like to end and acknowledge uh, some of the people who worked in the laboratory, a group of my former postdocs who all came together back in uh, 2018 to celebrate uh, 
their ability to uh, come to New York and talk about their work. So with that, I will stop and take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jeff, for that uh, outstanding seminar. Very, very informative. Um, we're going to take questions now. If you could raise your hands, um, please do, and then we'll we'll open up the mics and uh, allow you to ask a question. There is one hand up here. I see Emily. You want to go ahead, Amira? He's on mute, I'm afraid. I think they're activated. Hi, Emily. Are you on? You may be on mute, Mira. Maybe you can open up your mic, please. Apparently, that didn't work. Um, please feel free to raise a hand if you have a question. Um, maybe I'll start, Jeff. I wanted to just, uh, I'm not an expert in, in this field by any means, but uh, I, I was wondering as I listened to your presentation, um, to what degree the FC domains of these various classes of, for example, the IgGs contribute to their, their half-life, the length of their half-life, in, in the body. Right, so um, half-life of an antibody is determined by another type of receptor called the FCRN or the neonatal receptor. Very different type of receptor. It's, it's a uh, MHC type molecule engaging beta-2 microglobulin to form a complex. Uh, it can bind at acidic pHs, protecting the antibody uh, in vesicles and then release it at neutral pH. And it accounts for the antibody's half-life. The subclasses all bind FCRN uh, essentially equivalently, and that will give you the uh, same half-life. It's not influenced by glycan. It's a separate domain from the domains that bind the type 1 and type 2 FC receptors. So it's a third class of, of uh, antibody receptors involved in, uh, in half-life. But it can be manipulated, and there are variants that have been developed where uh, you can change the FC to extend the half-life. And some of these antibodies now have a half-life instead of the normal 21-day half-life in the human up to six months. So you could really wow. extend quite dramatically. It's the same mechanism that Albert is, uses to maintain its long serum half-life. It uses the same receptor. Great, thanks. Um, I think, Matthew, you had a question? Want to go ahead? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I've been following your work on salic acid on antibodies for a while now. Um, just a question about how, could you speak to how the body can regulate the amount of salic acid on antibodies? Right. So the, the phenomenon has is, is been observed now in, in quite a few different clinical situations. So after vaccination, for example, we see changes in the level of sialic acid on antibodies. And this level of sialic acid correlates with the, the uh, breadth of protection, actually. So we know that sialating antibodies is a mechanism by which affinity maturation and breadth of antibody response can, in fact, be regulated. The actual inputs to that, Matthew, are, are still being worked out. We're not quite clear what are the factors that are modulating sialation. We know that it's occurring in the germinal center reaction, uh, but it's clearly an area for, for actors uh, investigation. We also know that sialation modulates antibodies' ability to generate an inflammatory response. And we see changes in sialation occurring during the relapses uh, and during remissions of autoimmune diseases. So patients with autoantibodies uh, for RA, for example, will show higher levels of sialic acid on those autoantibodies during remission and lower levels during uh, their uh, relapses. And the same is true in other autoimmune diseases. We also see regulation of uh, fucose. So fucosylation is another way of modulating through different receptors, the ability of the FC to engage uh, the FCR3A receptor. And we see fucosylation being modulated, once again, in various 
inflammatory states during infectious diseases and so forth. So I think the, the modulation of the glycan is the way the immune system has evolved to regulate the various pathways antibodies can use through their FC domains. We can mimic that by making amino acid modifications to therapeutic antibodies, but in the body that's done through glycan modifications and subclass selection. Um, there's a there's a one question from the chat here uh, from uh, Vivek Kumar. Thanks for your informative presentation. What are your thoughts on COVID vaccine and their vaccines and their effectiveness, particularly in the background of flu shots? Right. So, I think the uh, right now we don't have any correlates of protection for COVID vaccines. The assumption has been that potency of neutralization will correlate with potency of protection or perhaps therapy. But as I showed you from our data, that may not be necessarily correct. So I think one of the things that we will begin to find out as these various vaccines are rolled out and we begin to characterize the responses in these patients, both antibody responses and T cell responses, is that we'll begin to get some parameters that will inform us as to what are the effective um, correlates for protection. I think certainly antibody neutralization would be one of them. I suspect effective response would be another one. I think the ability to induce potent T cell responses would be a third. But at this point, it's anyone's guess. Uh, I'm somewhat disappointed that, the, uh, that the, the field has really focused exclusively on neutralization when we have no data supporting that at this point. Another question from the chat, uh, Jeff. Uh, can you speculate on why many lower vertebrates make antibodies lacking the FC region? So I'm not sure I understand what meant by lacking the FC region. Which specific species are they thinking about? Because all the way going back to sharks, we can see antibodies with FC domains. I mean, they're not as well characterized. We certainly know that you know we see FC domains in all vertebrate species that I'm aware of. In, uh, in the lamprey, the antibody-like molecules that Max Cooper has characterized are really quite different in their, uh, in their structure. But my suspicion is that they use a mechanism similar to what IgM uses, which are the, the C-reactive proteins or the pentraxin-like mechanisms that couple to antigen recognition mechanisms. So I think it's, it, it's still an area that needs uh, much more attention. We're, we're pretty much focused on mammalian receptors, but some work, you know, I think, has begun to point to other vertebrate species. We better move on to the next question. Um, there was one more hand raised. Uh, I won't, uh, sorry about the name, uh, Sneha? Yeah, no problem, Sneha. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I'm curious about the uh, variation of effects um, from patient to patient that you see with anti-CD20 or rituximab. Um, sometimes we see prolonged hypogammaglobulinemia in certain patients who receive rituxx. Is Do you think that's due to FC variability between patients or what's your take on Well, that? I, mean, I think that's certainly one possibility that, uh, I mean, the, the CD20 is expressed on, on obviously normal B cells and you're depleting normal B cells. Penetration of CD20 is gonna make a difference as well into various uh, compartments, including the bone marrow and uh, in the spleen. But there are alleles that will dictate the degree of cytotoxicity. And I suspect the background state of the patient can modulate the inflammatory status, which changes the levels of various FC receptors that affect the cells. But I don't know of studies that have actually looked at that carefully. The ones that I'm aware of are the ones that looked at antibody, uh, sorry, um, tumor responses in patients who, who were treated for lymphoma or, uh, or other uh, CD20 related diseases. Great, thank you. All right, we uh, should move on again, Jeff, thanks for the outstanding presentation and uh, Cap on behalf of everyone at the University of Alberta and, and everyone listening, um, I wish we could give you more, um, but that's the nature of the beast at this point.
Um, next, I, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Armin Gamper to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Bruce Stillman. Uh, Armin is an assistant professor in the Department of Oncology here. And as I said, he'll introduce Bruce. Thank you. Yeah, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bruce Stillman. He is the Gerner Award Laureate of 2019, and I quote for his pioneering research on the eukaryotic DNA replication cycles, including initiation, regulation, and responses to DNA damage. Now, most of you know Dr. Stillman from his groundbreaking discovery of the origin recognition complex in eukaryotes, which is now described in every major cell biology textbook, or his studies on regulatory mechanisms of replication, such as the CDK independent function of P21, or how chromatin is assembled during replication, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on for a long time, but I'm sure that we will hear about some of his discoveries during Dr. Stillman's talk. Now, fewer of you might know, and I bring this up because for good or bad, this has been the year of the virus in science and in our daily life. So few of you might know that Dr. Stillman started his adventure in DNA replication, studying viruses, the model system that delivered insight into so many cellular functions, transcription, cell signal, and CompTMI as well. So around 40 years ago, Dr. Stillman, who originally is from Melbourne, left Australia for the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory to continue his studies on the replication of adenovirus and SV40 before later switching to eukaryotes. As the saying goes, the rest is history. Cold Spring Harbor is still his scientific home. Indeed, and this is very seldom seen, he rose through the ranks from postdoc all the way to its leader to become its president. Now, Dr. Stillman received numerous awards besides the Gerner, such as the Alfred Sloan, the Louisa Gross Hurwitz, and the Heineken Prize. He is also a well known advocate for science something that is not an easy task nowadays in the US, although I personally hope it might become easier after the election in two weeks. So with that short introduction, I give the unfortunately virtual podium over to Dr. Stillman. Well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And uh, I too hope that um, things change in the, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, in the United States, at least. Um, so I hope you can see my uh, screen. And uh, I will start. I want to first of all thank you for the invitation. Um, you're going to hear something very different from what you just heard from Jeff. Um, and I want to actually just take this opportunity because it is uh, very different from kind of the clinical relevant research that Jeff talked about. Um, that the Gardner Foundation and the Gardner Awards actually recognize fundamental discovery science, which uh, is uh, what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, but it really gets at how uh, life um, works, and uh, I think that's uh, important to understand. So uh, I'll start from the beginning uh, talking about uh, uh, DNA replication, but I want to start as uh, Jeff did in the late 1800s when Walter Sutton and uh, uh, Theodore Bovary um, first used microscopes as they became powerful in the late um, part of the uh, 1800s uh, to look in uh, various species at chromosomes. And they came to the idea that chromosomes were the unit of inheritance. This was soon after Mendel's laws um, of genetics were published, but actually not known, well known by then until 1900 and also after Darwin's speculation that there must be some units of inheritance that explained uh, natural selection and evolution. Um, I also want to point out the, uh, the species that they used. Uh, the, the, one of the nice things about biology is you can learn from lots of different species, and they study grasshoppers and sea urchins, among others. Of course, later on in the early part of last century, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan and his uh, collaborators and colleagues uh, really nailed the idea that mutations were linked to chromosomes and uh, these genes were scattered along chromosomes. But in 1953, as you all know, the uh, discovery of the structure of the double helix of DNA really um, 
kind of pointed to some very, very important conclusions and fundamental conclusions about um, the nature of inheritance. Uh, of course, uh, Jim and Francis uh, proposed the structure based on studies, uh, uh, experimental studies from Rosalind Franklin and, uh, and Morris Wilkins. And uh, down the bottom here shows that this uh, double helix had really three big implications. One was that um, there was a self-templating mechanism that could explain inheritance, um, that there seems to be a code that was embedded in the, um, in, in the sequence of bases that they found, and this could explain uh, the Mendelian inheritance. And also the sequence of uh, bases could change, which could explain Darwinian natural selection and evolution. And so these were very, very big, and, and this is why the discovery of the double helix was so important. However, um, even though the self-templating mechanism was, um, was uh, turned out to be correct, um, it doesn't do it by itself. And the question is, what happens here? And uh, just before um, the, uh, 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 the Nobel Prize was given for the, uh, the double helix, um, the uh, mechanism of actually polymerization of DNA um, was figured out by Arthur Kornberg, and he won the Nobel Prize actually three years before uh, Jim and Francis and Morris Wilkins. So, um, and, and Arthur Kornberg went on to, to show that uh, how bacterial chromosomes replicate, but uh, we are interested in replication of chromosomes of eukaryotes, which are much bigger and much more complicated. And of course, there are multiple chromosomes. In a human cells, um, there is two meters of DNA in every cell, one uh, meter from one parent and the other meter from the other parent of about 3 billion base pairs. Uh, these um, cells here are cheek cells from uh, a person. Uh, this is These dark blue spots here are the uh, nuclei which contain the DNA. These cells are rather large compared to the nuclear volume and uh, that changes in cancer. Uh, and the small blue spots here are bacteria. So you can see the relative size of bacteria to, um, to the nucleus of a cell. But the DNA inside the nucleus of a cell is highly compacted and of course is compacted by the histones and other mechanisms that uh, pack it into this tiny little nucleus. If you... Um, look at the proliferation of cells in our body with just in uh, there are many proliferating tissues but just in the bone marrow there are about 500 million new blood cells born every minute mostly to, to make uh, red blood cells for the carrying oxygen around the body but also the white blood cells um, and other immune cells that you just heard about from Jeff. These uh, DNA extracted from uh, 500 million cells would stretch about a million kilometers uh, if you have two, two meters of DNA in every cell. And this um, amount of DNA is a phenomenal length. Uh, I've asked many people how long a million kilometers is. And uh, so I actually calculated it uh, in terms of the following, that it's 25 times around the equator of the earth. So imagine a copying machine in 500 million cells that can produce uh, every minute of one's life in the bone marrow enough cells uh, and DNA that would, when stretched out, would go around the, uh, the equator of the Earth 25 times. And of course, this is all done in 46 chromosomes in human cells uh, that have to be duplicated precisely once and only once per cell division. So the question is, how does this work? Well, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I first got into this when I was a graduate student and I was interested in viruses that cause cancer, adenovirus and SV40 virus. Um, and because I became interested in cancer and the idea was that DNA replication, errors in DNA replication could contribute to cancer. This is the products of DNA replication. This is a normal karyotype. And this karyotype can be drawn like this. This is a normal karyotype, but this is the cervical carcinoma from HeLa, um, the famous uh, cell line of a, car uh, a cervical cancer that was isolated in the 1950s. You can see very many, many chromosomal abnormalities and uh, copy number variations along chromosomes and, uh, and recombination. And these uh, are caused by errors in DNA replication, but also errors in mitosis. 
these errors accumulate more rapidly if mutations occur in certain genes that do not protect the genome uh, from accumulating these errors. So the combination of replication errors, mutations and, uh, and copy number variations, and also chromosome abnormalities uh, and aneuploidy really is the hallmark of cancer. So we started studying uh, DNA replication um, using adenovirus, but adenovirus replicates in a very um, unusual way. Uh, in fact, when I was a graduate student, we thought that it might be actually the model for how telomeres replicate, but that turned out not to be the case. But SV40 turned out to be a fantastic model for replication. And uh, that came um, about because of uh, the experiments from Lee and Kelly, who in 1984 developed cell-free extracts that could replicate plasmids that contained the SV40 origin to produce two uh, identical plasmids. And this depended upon the virus encoded SV40 T antigen, which is an origin binding protein and a helicase and also cell extracts originally from infected monkey cells in the case of Lee and Kelly, but later on in, the, in our case and in Tom Kelly's case uh, from human cells. And we use recombinant T antigen actually produced in the bacula virus to produce identical DNA. And I also discovered that if you add other extracts in turn, including a nuclear extract, that you could not only replicate the DNA to produce DNA as shown here, which is relaxed DNA, but you could replicate the DNA and it would supercoil because of the loading on of nucleosomes, um, the assembly of nucleosomes um, by activities present in the nuclear extract. And this is an electron micrograph, actually I took myself, um, of uh, these small uh, replicative uh, plasmids the containing the SV40 origin that have nucleosomes attached to them. Uh, later on, this turned out to be uh, one of the important factors in these nuclear extracts was the protein CARF1 for chromatin assembly factor. It was the first DNA replication uh, dependent chromatin assembly factor identified. This is a summary of, of many of the proteins that uh, we and others went on to identify. Um, Tom Kelly's laboratory, Jerry Howitz's laboratory, and my own laboratory particularly, went on to identify. And many of these proteins we uh, purified, discovered using the SV40 system. And um, including the PCNA protein, the replication factor C, CARF1, and, uh, and RPA, and many other proteins. And uh, only a, a few of these were known before um, as replication proteins, a polymerase alpha primase complex, and topoisomerases, and that was about it. But um, this work also had an impact on other fields. For instance, many of these proteins turned out to be involved in not only DNA replication, but in DNA recombination as shown in the blue spots here. Um, and also in uh, DNA repair as shown in the green uh, dots here and DNA checkpoint controls. That is controls that would um, signal to the cell that something has gone wrong and prevent cell division until the damage has um, been repaired. So this, these proteins have had quite an important role in many aspects of cell division and uh, DNA metabolism. In addition, as I said, um, this system enabled the beginnings and the later on working out of the inheritance of nucleosomes and uh, my former postdoc, Shiko Zhang, who worked in my laboratory on, on CARF1. Um, this is a summary from a review that he's done and has followed up and discovered many of these proteins. Um, and uh, they are the, the assembly, de novo assembly of nucleosomes is linked to the replication fork uh, and the inheritance of the parental nucleosomes, which is transmitting information, the uh, attachment of uh, of uh, histone modifications to these nucleosomes is of course inherited as well. And this is now so-called epigenetic inheritance um, occurs through this mechanism here. When Jago was in my laboratory, he studied CARF1 in yeast and we showed that mutations in this system um, cause epigenetic switching of uh, genes that are normally silent in the Saccharomyces species. And this shows uh, the effect of CARF1 mutations in the budding yeast, showing that normally silent genes are not stably inherited um, 
in these yeast cells. Furthermore, we went on in uh, collaboration with uh, Takashi Araki's laboratory in Kyoto in Japan to show that CARF1 mutants were um, the equivalent of fasciation mutants, the so-called FAS mutants in Arabidopsis. This shows the uh, shoot apical meristem, the growing tip of a plant, and the primordial leaves that are spinning off from this uh, stem cell bunch that is growing here. The same thing happens on the root apical meristem as well. This is the wild type, but in the calf one mutants, the number of stem cells greatly proliferates and you get very, very variable um, cell uh, plants, including thick uh, stalks of variable, um, uh, thick stems of variable size, but also um, variable uh, flower and branching morphogenesis and uh, this is an example of fasciation that I took from Wikipedia, which is a daisy that has got increased stem cells that produce abnormal flower shapes. So this shows that CARF1 is involved in epigenetic inheritance in plants, as well as yeast. And we also collaborated with uh, Bob Horvitz's laboratory, and where he developed this really interesting system for which he won the Nobel Prize of following the lineage of um, cells in the entire worm. And he was able to identify cells, for instance, this particular cell that has a sister, which is an epithelial cell. And this sister would, um, this sister cell here, the MI cell would generate, uh, would di differentiate into a, a neuron um, and its sister is an epithelial cell. But the decision to do this occurs back in the grandmother cell that then epigenetically is inherited to cause a neuron. And in a CARF1 mutant or histone mutants or PCNA mutants um, uh, was shown in this work in collaboration with them that normally an epithelial cell would, um, this one is here and its sister cell would be a neuron over here. But in, the, in these mutants, um, both of these would be um, epithelial cells. And so this, uh, cell type fate switching would not occur in these CARF1 or um, PCNA mutants. So this shows that in various organisms that this system is very important, not only for the inheritance of DNA, but the inheritance of epigenetic states. So the question then is using viruses only can go so far because SV40 T antigen is uh, an important protein, but it's encoded by the virus. And the question is, how are chromosomes duplicated? And how is this whole process controlled? And so we first turned uh, to studying this um, by studying it in the uh, yeast, the budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this was done for a number of reasons. This is a photograph of budding yeast, the yeast that's used to make beer, bread, and wine. And uh, this is an electron micrograph um, taken from this paper down here. Um, in the mid 1970s, showing a part of a chromosome where replication has started here in the case of this replication forks moving bidirectionally away from this origin. Another origin firing a little bit later here with two forks either side, and then a third origin that fired with forks here and here. You can see that the replication size is uh, different and therefore there's been sequential initiation of DNA replication during S phase along this chromosome. But many origins shown like here and here and here and here have not yet fired, but they are potential origins. And in fact, these early origins that have fired, and there are many origins that will fire later in the cell cycle shown here, but some of them like this one here, are what are called dormant origins that don't normally fire unless they're required to. They're essentially an emergency backup. All of these uh, red arrows are sites of potential origins of DNA replication in the genome. And the reason why we chose Saccharomyces is that it had been shown that you can take sequences from the genome and clone them onto a plasmid. They're called autonomously replicating sequences. And they would confer upon those plasmids the ability to replicate like a um, large chromosome. And um, many years later, we uh, identified uh, this complex and uh, also John Diffley's laboratory identified this complex called the pre-replicative complex 
that's formed on all origins of DNA replication. And I'm gonna talk in detail about this. So this licenses all of these origins of replication actually during the G1 phase of the um, cell cycle so that all of the origins are potential origins and they have to be activated as cells commit to cell division. So I'll tell you the story and the details about how this complex was um, formed. The real breakthrough, as was mentioned in the introduction, came with the discovery of the origin recognition complex by Steve Bell, which followed up on studies by a graduate student, uh, York Marins, um, who's now a professor at the University of Minnesota. And uh, he, what he did was um, define in great detail the nature of the sequences in the origins of replication. He showed that there were multiple elements um, and these two elements here bound to the origin recognition complex, but there were more elements. And uh, when Steve purified ORC, which was purified using a DNA one footprinting assay, shown here is the DNA without ORC bound and here shown the DNA with ORC bound. And this is a protection from deoxyribonuclease digestion. And um, what's interesting is that this requires ATP to bind to the DNA, which was extremely unusual back in 1992. ORC turned out to be a six subunit protein complex. And it, the reason is that it has many functions in addition to binding origins of replication, as you will see. Later on, when many origins were characterized and the ORC binding sites, this shows um, the uh, consensus sequence to which ORC binds, and that is the A and the B1 elements out of these four elements in the origin. So this really set the stage. Once we had ORC, you could then go and do both biochemistry and genetics to look for ORC interacting proteins and other proteins that would be binding to origins of replication in, in, uh, that are dependent upon this protein complex. And that uh, led to the idea that um, there was a pre-replicative complex assembled. Um, and uh, what was shown was that it could only be assembled uh, during the G1 phase or after mitosis in Saccharomyces. This turns out to be, as you'll see later, a little bit different in different species. But um, in Saccharomyces, uh, there is the cyclin-dependent kinases, the enzymes that were discovered by um, uh, Lee Hartwell, Paul Nurse, uh, Tim Hunt, and, uh, and Masui, uh, that uh, really, um, uh, for which uh, three of them won the Nobel Prize, for the discovery of the cyclin-dependent kinases that drive the cell division cycle. And also what was uh, Tim Hunt observed was that the cyclins were cyclically synthesized and um, then degraded. And this mechanism of degradation, the ubiquitin mediated proteolysis, uh, for which there was also a, a separate Nobel Prize, um, explains why in G1 phase, there's no uh, mitotic like cyclins. There are G1 cyclins and I'll mention those later, but um, these are the, the mitotic cyclins are pretty, pretty much absent in G1. This allows a, a window of opportunity for assembly of the pre-replicative complex. And then paradoxically, the cyclin-dependent kinases and another protein kinase system, which we have characterized extensively called the DDK or CDC7 DBF4 kinase, which is also cyclically synthesized and degraded um, both of these kinase systems are required for the initiation of DNA replication. And replication, as I showed you, goes through a temporal phase throughout S phase, and then completion of replication allows cells to enter into mitosis, also driven by high levels of cyclin-dependent kinase. So the idea here is that the pre-replicative complex licenses cells for replication, this complex is destroyed because it's used on all of the origins that are utilized during S phase. But because cyclin dependent kinases inhibit the formation of the pre replicative complex, they can't be formed during this phase. And you need to go through mitosis to get back into this phase here so you can re, re, re initiate DNA replication. So this is the mechanism by which uh, chromosomes are replicated only once per cell division. 
Once each pre-replicative complex is used, it's destroyed. And in fact, some of the protein complexes like CDC6 in, in yeast are also destroyed upon the G1 to S phase transition by ubiquitin mediated proteolysis. So this is kind of the logic behind the cell cycle, but I wanna talk now about how this all works. In 2009, both John Diffley's laboratory and uh, Christian Speck in collaboration with my laboratory, um, Christian's a former postdoc as you'll see in a minute, uh, reconstituted this first process of assembly of pre-replicative complexes in vitro with purified proteins. Orc, as I mentioned, binds to the DNA and recruits the CDC6 protein, which is highly related to the Orc1 subunit. This forms a um, structure on the DNA where the DNA is bent, as you'll see. And then this recruits the first MCM uh, hexameric complex of six different MCM proteins, but all forming a hexamer, chaperoned by this CTD1 protein. That is loaded on, and then a second one is loaded on in a head-to-tail manner, a head-to-head -head manner, so that they're in opposite directions to form the pre-replicative complex. This process is inhibited by cyclin-dependent kinases and the reason why this can only form in G1 phase. And then this complex is activated by CDK and DDK kinases to load many, many proteins on, including the GINs and CDC45 to form the active helicase, which Mike Botchen's laboratory at the first characterized this reaction called the CMG helicase. Subsequently, many other proteins using um, yeast genetics and the SV40 system identified a total of um, about 59 polypeptides that can, complement, uh, can get together and replicate um, the uh, DNA. And in fact, uh, other proteins uh, such as these down here can replicate not only the DNA, but assemble chromatin. And uh, this was reconstituted with entirely purified proteins, first the initiation in 2015, and then the entire process in 2017 in a number of labs, but particularly in John's lab. So this is what we know. Many of these, many of these proteins, uh, whoops, many of these proteins here um, were identified either, as I said, using the SV40 system or using yeast genetics uh, and biochemistry. So I want to go through the initiation of replication, and I've done this work in collaboration with a former postdoc, Christian Speck, who first came to my laboratory in, uh, in the uh, mid, uh, early 2000s and uh, started doing biochemistry on pre-RC assembly. And we collaborated with uh, Huiling Li, who used to be at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is down the road from Cold Spring Harbor. And he's a cryo-electron microscopy expert. And we have also collaborated with my colleague at Cold Spring Harbor, Limor Joshua Tor, who is a X-ray crystallographer and now cryo EM specialist who does structural biology. And beginning back in, um, in uh, 2005, we published the first paper, as you'll see, with low resolution cryo EM. But as you know, there's been a revolution in cryo electron microscopy for which there was also another Nobel Prize given um, for the uh, development of high resolution cryo electron microscopy, which has really truly transformed the field of structural biology. And we have used these techniques to figure out the details of how this process works. So this is the assembly pathway of orc binding to DNA, recruiting CDC6, bending the DNA, then recruiting the first um, MCM protein complex to form what we call the OCCM, the orc CDC6 CDD1 MCM complex. And then there's a second uh, a step where orc moves over here and forms what's called the MCM orc complex, which has been characterized by um, Costa and Diffley's laboratories. And then a second MCM is loaded to form the pre-replicative complex. The cryo-EM structures of many of these uh, have been done. Uh, these are low resolution 2D, 2D cryo-EM images of the um, different complexes that have been uh, formed. And many of these shown in the boxes um, shown here have been done at high resolution. Uh, this one was done in Big Tai's laboratory in collaboration with Gao's laboratory in Beijing. Uh, 
uh, pick ties in Hong Kong. But these structures here, this one, this one, and this one was done uh, with uh, Christian Speck and Hui Ling Li. Uh, and uh, this one here is only a low resolution structure that came from the characterization of this complex from uh, Costa and Diffley's laboratories. So I'm gonna show you some of the structures of this one here, um, this one here, and this one here. You can see the detail and how we can get some biology out of this interesting structures. This is the structure of, um, this is not published yet, but this is the structure of the AUK CDC6 complex at 3.3 angstroms resolution. The green here is AUK1. Uh, this uh, teal color here is um, CDC6. And then uh, this is the uh, AUK3 subunit and AUK6 over here. And you can see that the DNA is profoundly bent uh, by binding to this. And it goes through the, ch the through, as you'll see, through the channel of this um, protein complex. So this is a movie showing the uh, protein uh, going around and you can see that the DNA goes through the middle of this complex um, and uh, is bent. And uh, you'll see this later on also in the OCCM complex. Now this is the precursor to loading the first MCM protein. And um, work in Christian Speck's laboratory um, and uh, collaborative studies with Hu Yun Li, uh, um, we've been able to characterize various states of this AUK CDC6 complex shown here with the first MCM complex bound. And you can see that the MCMs bind through these winged helix domains that are at the C terminus of each of the MCMs with winged helix domains that are at the C terminus of each of the AUK and CDC6 proteins. So these winged helices reach out to each other and interact, as you'll see, and are, are involved in loading on this double helix into the channel of what's going to become the DNA helicase. And by doing either biochemistry with mutant um, MCMs or computationally categorizing these different structures into um, uh, computationally into different uh, structures that have their, their um, structure has been identified using cryo-EM. Uh, we were able to identify three states, a semi-attached OCCM, where you could see the winged helices bound uh, to AUK, but you couldn't see the rest of the MCMs. So these winged helices and, and the MCMs were waving in the breeze, but attached by the winged helices. And then you could see a, a pre-insertion MCM complex where the DNA was not inserted and then the, ins the um, inserted OCCM or in fact, I'll show you in a minute, the full OCCM without a mutant. And this um, shows the, uh, a summary of a lot of work of all of these different complexes of how this complex is loaded. In the middle of this MCM complex are some of the winged helices that have to move out of the way to enable this double helix to load inside this channel here. And this cho shows you how this occurs, um, where the, the DNA is then moved by the AUK and CDC6 into this channel, and then the channel closes. You can see this happening again. These are the six MCM subunits, and this blue protein here is the CDT1 chaperone protein that is keeping uh, the MCM complex open until it can receive the DNA. Once it, it hydrolyzes ATP, then this um, blue protein will fall off. This is the final product of the MCM double hexamer. Here's one MCM hexamer and another MCM hexamer with the double helix going through the middle of the channel. You can see the, the DNA going through the middle of this channel here. And the two MCMs are head to head. And this is the loaded onto the origin of DNA replication. And this is the pre-replicative complex that is, a, that is now licensing all origins of replication. This is the structure of the wild type OCCM, the 14 subunit protein complex that was done at about 3.9 angstroms resolution and published a number of years ago. This shows AUK and CDC6 up here and the first MCM with its CTD1 chaperone attached to it. 
And if I start this movie, you can see that this complex, um, just the DNA goes through the middle, middle of these uh, ring-shaped complexes. These are all AAA plus ATPase molecules that um, form this channel, which you can see the double helix going through the middle of the channel and down into the MCMs. And uh, the DNA gets a little bit um, uh, uh, unstructured down here because this part of the um, MCMs have not yet closed. It will close completely once the second MCM, which is going to be loaded down here in a opposite direction, uh, is loaded on with the orc moving around to the other side. Now, when this structure was done, we noticed something very interesting, that there was an alpha helix in the uh, orc 4 subunit and also loops in the orc 2 subunit shown here that were interacting in a potentially sequence specific manner with the DNA. Now that was of interest because the reason why we started studying Saccharomyces was that Saccharomyces was known to have sequence specific uh, ARSs, which were later shown to be origins of DNA replication. Now, what was interesting about this is that when we compared uh, and this was also confirmed by the high resolution structure of ORC alone bound to DNA by the Gao and uh, Thai laboratories. So what was interesting about this, and I'm just going to show the ORC4 sequences. These are the ORC4 sequences that are aligned from all um, representatives of um, eukaryotes from all different uh, uh, walks of life, humans, plants, insects, and lots and lots of different fungi. You can see that there are two groups here. The, the ORC4 is actually relatively conserved, but except in this region where the alpha helix is in Saccharomyces, that's this pink region here, is not present in the vast majority of eukaryotes, including many, many species of budding yeasts, of uh, fission yeasts, of other fungi, of insects, plants, uh, and uh, animals, in fact, all animals. So this was of, of, of interest to us. And then the structures of Drosophila orc, the human orc done in collaboration with uh, Lamore Joshua Torr at Cold Spring Harbor, the Drosophila orc was done by um, James Berger and uh, Mike Botchen's laboratories in a collaboration. And uh, the uh, Cerevisiae orc from the OCCM structure showed that in fact in Drosophila and human this alpha helix is missing. This is an insertion into the yeast that's occurred during evolution. And in this exactly, I won't show you, but exactly the same thing happened with the orc 2 loops. The orc 2 loops are present in uh, Saccharomyces, but they're not present in Drosophila and human. So this suggested to us that these may actually be the determinants of sequence specific initiation of replication. And we went on to demonstrate that by making mutations in this alpha helix and then selecting origins of replication um, that um, uh, would function with these mutant alpha helices. And we showed that we could get origins that had a different, different sequence specificity. And that has actually just recently been published in the last week. This led to an interesting observation, and that's shown on this kind of what looks like a complicated slide, but I'll walk through it. This is the same different species now going from plants to humans to down the bottom here, plants, human, uh, animals and uh, represented by humans and insects represented by Drosophila. Uh, to budding, uh, to fission yeasts, to other fungi, and uh, lots and lots of different budding yeasts. We noticed that the species that had the ORC4 alpha helix and the ORC2 loop had been shown to have defined sequence specific origins of replication. The, sequen the, the species and the vast majority of eukaryotes that don't have this ORC4 alpha helix or the ORC2 loop did not have, so far, do not have sequence specific origins. Furthermore, 
When we first purified ORC, we showed that ORC was involved in transcriptional gene silencing because ORC bound to the SER proteins shown up here. Here's ORC1, which is ubiquitous in eukaryotes. And SER2 is ubiquitous in eukaryotes because it's a histone, an NAD dependent histone deacetyltransferase. But the other SER proteins are only present in a few of these um, budding yeasts like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which has the most. SER4 is the ancient one of these, and it's in fact related to nuclear lamins in structure that we, John Diffley and I found many, many years ago. And it binds to this nuclear envelope associated protein called ESC1. Now, what's interesting about this is that these SER proteins bind to ORC and ORC tethers them to the sites in the genome where there's going to be transcriptional gene silencing at the mating type locus. These species down here don't have these SER proteins. They don't have SER4. And you'll notice that SER4 is precisely co-evolved with the ORC4 alpha helix and ORC2 loop and sequence specific origins. Most eukaryotes silence gene expression using RNA interference, uh, interference, and that's shown down in this uh, box down here. And this is a small box, but in fact, it's the vast majority of eukaryotes. We notice that there are some transition species, um, particularly these three, uh, these four yeasts here. But some of these yeasts, like Candida albicans, have been shown to have a version of RNA interference that is quite diverged from the canonical eukaryotic RNA interference. But there was one species that we became really interested in, and that's Euroia lipolytica, that does not have the SER proteins. It does not have sequence-specific origins, as far as we can tell. It doesn't have RNA interference, and yet it has ORC1, um, and it has uh, SER2. So we've started working on this species to find out, first, how, what is the nature of origins of DNA replication in this species, which are not really known? And the other is, how does this silence uh, genes in, in that are projunctive genes in this yeast? Now, this is an unusual yeast because it's heterothallic, meaning that it has two sexes, a male and a female called Mat A and Mat B. Um, so it's more like human than it is Saccharomyces in, the, in that respect. Furthermore, it has sequences like uh, large amounts of RDNA that need to be um, protected as the SER proteins do from recombination. And we're very interested in finding out how that occurs. So we think this is going to be an interesting model, but in the meantime, we've been working on human cell replication and trying to understand that. This is a, su a summary of the differences that are present between budding yeast and human. As I showed you in budding yeast, ORC is present throughout the cell cycle. CDC6 is degraded at the G1 to S phase boundary and resynthesized prior to mitosis. And then as I mentioned, during G1 phase, ORC and CDC6 combine to form pre-replicative complexes. In human cells, it's a lot more complicated than that. In human cells, CDC6 is degraded at mitosis. And ORC1 is degraded as cells progress through G1 phases, I'll show you in a minute. And the only time that these proteins are present is in mid-G1 when cyclin E CDK2 is active. And it's been known that cyclin E CDK2, which binds to ORC and CDC6, is required for pre-replicative complex assembly. Later on, cyclin A CDK2 are made, and this actually causes the degradation of ORC, but also, interestingly and paradoxically, the initiation of DNA replication. So we've been looking at this system, and we showed using GFP labeled ORC1, that ORC1, when it's resynthesized, shown here, binds to the condensing chromosomes as in, and is inherited on the chromosomes um, through mitosis into the next G1 phase. And it is only then that the full ORC complex is reassembled in the G1 phase of the cell cycle after um, cytokinesis and telophase, that ORC reassembles and then in mid G1 binds 
uh, CDC6. And this shows is a movie showing um, GFP labeled ORC1. This cell is immediately after this phase here, the telophere phase, so the telof telophase. So this cell is in very early G1 phase of the cell division cycle. And if I play this movie, you can see that ORC patterns during G1 and is lost as cells progress through G1 phase. You'll see this go through again. Um, and so ORC is gradually lost from chromatin, but as you'll see, it's lost from early replication, um, early replicating DNA first, and ends up uh, on a few sites which happen to be uh, the centromeres of, of the cell, which are highly heterochromatic. So this shows this um, pathway here. And what's interesting is that ORC1 binds directly to cyclin A CDK2, which we've demonstrated. And this recruits a um, ubiquitin ligase, this one here, to degrade ORC1 um, as cells progress through G1 phase and into S, uh, just before they enter S phase. So the same cyclin CDK is degrading ORC1 but it is also required for the initiation of DNA replication on the, pre the, the, the complexes that are assembled after pre-replicative complex assembly. So this shows a kind of a unique independence of, um, of de degradation of the thing that's going to initiate replication to by the complex um, that actually initiates DNA synthesis. Now, this is really interesting because, and I'll finish up with this, that these cyclin-dependent kinases are interestingly driving a lot of things that are happening during G1 phase. So in this experiment, what we did is we pulse-labeled DNA with bromodeoxyuridine for 15 minutes in S phase of the cell cycle. So only a subset of the genome is going to be replicated because of this temporal patterning of DNA replication through, um, through S phase. Then what we did is we followed these cells through mitosis and into G1 when we imaged the YFP ORC1, which is the images you just saw, and could co to see whether um, there would be co-localization of BRDU patterning with ORC patterning. Now, this is an interesting, if you think about it, this is an interesting experiment where pulse labeling 15 minutes, the DNA in a cell, the replicating DNA in a cell in this cell cycle. And now we're looking in this cell cycle at ORC1 patterns and how it corresponds to BRDU. And in fact, by doing movies, you can trap a cell that has inherited its BRDU pattern. Remember, this DNA is labeled with bromine deoxyuridine, inherited its pattern. And this happens to be a late replicating pattern. We know that by how um, replication patterning occurs. And you can see that some of the, um, but not all, of the ORC1 is overlapping with this. But it's quite remarkable, this um, overlap of patterning. You can see here and here. Now, it's not all because these very late replicating regions that are, that are um, around the periphery of the nucleus will be labeled with ORC later on in the G1 phase. And so this is just a snapshot of a movie that's that we took these. And you can see that the ORC1 patterning in gene one phase is reflecting the patterning of DNA replication that's going to happen later on in the cell cycle. And so we think that, and it's been known for a long time that the replication patterning is inherited. And we think that's because the ORC patterning is also inherited and it's epigenetic and we're trying to figure out the mechanism for this. One clue is that this is the crystal structure, the crystal structure of uh, ORC done in Lamour Joshua Tor's laboratory in collaboration with us. These are the proteins that we know, not all of them I've shown here, all of the proteins that bind. And you can see that we've shown that ORC binds this histone, DS, uh, histone acetyltransferase, a histone methyl transferase, um, this other histone methyl transferase here. In fact, histone modifications that's been shown by us and others and nucleosomes. 
CDC6, in fact, the retinoblastoma protein, which is involved in transcriptional gene silencing, cyclin-dependent kinases, protein phosphatases, and heterochromatin proteins. All of these proteins are either involved in control of DNA replication, control of the cell division cycle and transcriptional gene silencing, or um, replication itself, or in fact, epigenetic inheritance. So our model is that ORC binds, and in fact, all of these proteins bind to ORC1, which is really quite amazing. And ORC1 is the first subunit that binds to chromosomes during mitosis. And we have uh, got a paper under review, which is on BioArchive, that shows mutations in some of these, um, in, in ORC1, in some of these binding proteins that profoundly messes up DNA replication. So we think that replication specificity based on this and some other things is going to be epigenetically inherited in most eukaryotes. And uh, the relationship between this and um, how replication occurs in a temporal patterning is something that needs to be figured out. I wanna finish um, just with this interesting uh, slide, which I've shown many times. And this is from Gareth Williams and Ron Lasky. These proteins have turned out to be very, very valuable for um, various diagnoses. Uh, PCNA antibodies have long been known to be important diagnostics for um, proliferating cells. But I wanna point out that the MCMs are particularly good at this. This is staining of the MCM, using an MCM antibody of the normal cervix of a, of a woman. And these are the stem cells that are in cell cycle, not the ones that are actually going through S phase, but all of these cells are stem cells in cycle that are producing the cells that'll differentiate and eventually sloth off into the, surf, the, the, the surface of the surf, cervix and then be released um, as cells turn over. Caused by a cancer-causing virus, the human papillomavirus, a cervical cancer leads to a rapidly proliferating or a proliferating tissue that um, the stem cells are still labeled with MCMs uh, shown here, but all of these cells do not differentiate and they form a carcinoma. And all of these cells label with MCMs, and this is true for almost all cancers. So these have been actually quite valuable for looking at cancers in uh, humans. So I wanna thank you. Uh, this work was all done at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. This is an older photograph. We have a lot more labs built up here. But there's an older photograph of Cold Spring Harbor looking over towards Connecticut, which is up here, and eventually Canada, which is way, way in the North. Um, and uh, I wanna thank the people in, the current people in my laboratory. Um, the work on uh, yeast was done by uh, Elaine Hu and uh, Yi Jin Xu. Uh, and uh, the work I, talked about on the proteins binding to ORC have been done by Manza Hussain principally and uh, Kahula Kabala, but also um, men and uh, Mike and others in the laboratory and, and others that pre, pre, um, came before them. Uh, Najas is beginning the work on uh, Euroia uh, and uh, we're starting to try and understand that species in parallel with understanding humans. And I mentioned our important collaborators, uh, Christian Speck, Hoi Lin Lee, uh, and Lamore Joshua Tor for structural biology and biochemistry. And also um, our collaborators that have been very important in understanding the bioinformatics, uh, Justin Kinney, who's a faculty member at Cold Spring Harbor and his postdoc at Mark Turin. And this is the funding which we have received from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences, from the National Cancer Institute and from the Goldring Family Foundation and Colesman Hubble Laboratory over many years. So thank you very much for uh, listening to this talk. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, fantastic to hear and see. Um, uh, we're gonna open up the floor quickly for questions. Uh, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand um, or you can, you can enter it on the chat. So if nobody's going to jump on that opportunity, I will. Um, uh, Bruce, I had a couple of questions, but one in particular, I was wondering how the the replication rates vary in, between the in vitro reconstituted system and in vivo. And 
to that, I'm asking to what degree does the contribution of the overall nuclear organization contribute to replication? Well, actually, the what's remarkable is in the John's uh, John Diffley's uh, uh, lab that recon first reconstituted uh, other labs have done it now, but first reconstituted the entire process with purified proteins is the rate of replication is actually quite remarkably similar. The rate of fork movement is quite remarkably similar to the rate of fork movement in cells. The reason why you can replicate such a large genome with multiple chromosomes is that you have many origins along the genome. In yeast, there's about 500 of them we've identified. And in human cells, there's probably around about 50 to 100,000. And these each replicate once, forming a replicon, but many replicons replicate. And in, it's, it's also known principally from the work of David Gilbert that if you look at the large megabase scale of chromosomes, that um, chromosomes, as you know, are organized, or as you may know, are organized into these topologically um, structured domains or TADs. These are topologically associated domains, TADs. These TADs are fairly large loops of megabase or multi-megabase size. Each of these TADs is a unit of temporal regulation. One TAD will all replicate at roughly the same time. Another one will replicate adjacent to it at a different time in S phase. The other thing is that within a TAD, there are many, many origins. And these origins replicate in clusters. And in yeast, a cluster will consist of sequence-specific origins. But in humans, they probably are epigenetically determined and are stochastically selected uh, to initiate. Now, to show you the rate of replication, as you may know, in Xenopus uh, early embryos, the large um, egg that is fertilized to form the first embryo, those replicate very, very rapidly and undergo many, many cell divisions without transcription. So the large egg has all of the components to replicate the genome very rapidly. And those cell divisions happen extremely quickly with no gap phases. There's a S phase and an M phase. In that case, um, the origins are only 3KB apart. In the same thing happens in the syncytial nuclei of Drosophila um, eggs or embryos. The early embryo of Drosophila, the, the fertilized egg, forms a diploid nucleus that then goes from one to two to four to et cetera without um, cellularization and producing many, many rapid divisions. And again, there the origins are about 3KB apart. And so it's only at the mid blastular transition in both species that you get zygotic transcription and now replication goes like somatic replication where the origins are very far apart and you acquire this temporal patterning. So that's a, uh, a, a kind of a, in, in humans, of course, or mice, um, the one cell embryo, uh, one cell uh, embryo uh, almost immediately has gap phases and has zygotic transcription. So the, the way you speed up replication is have many, many origins. Uh, we probably have time for another question. Um, there's a couple that have just come up on, on the chat here. Um, thank you for the excellent talk. This is from S Stephanie Yano. You know? um, what controls whether an origin fires early versus late in S phase? Ah, well, that is going to depend upon the species, but um, we now know that some of the replication proteins are rate limiting. Therefore, not all origins can fire in S phase. We also know that um, the late replicating, the chromatin context plays a major role in this. For instance, in Saccharomyces, you can take a late replicating origin and put it in an early replication region and it'll replicate early. So it's not the sequence, it's the chromatin context. 
vice versa. You can take an early one and put it in a late replicating region and it'll replicate late. In most eukaryotes that have um, both facultative and constitutive heterochromatin, the heterochromatic regions replicate late and the euchromatic regions replicate early. And that's a developmentally regulated decision because genes that are expressed tend to replicate early and genes that are not expressed tend to replicate late. And, and for instance, in, in um, females, the inactive X replicates late, but the active X replicates early. So there's epigenetic inheritance of these timing of replication. And there's a series of proteins, mostly histone modification proteins um, that control uh, the timing of this. Not the, uh, the, the where, what origins fire is chromatin context and the timing is controlled by histone modifications. Unfortunately, it appears that we're pretty much out of time in order to keep um, our, our speakers on time with, with uh, the rest of their uh, schedules for the day. Uh, I'd like to conclude again by thanking Dr. Ravitch and Dr. Stillman for joining us virtually in Edmonton and for these outstanding presentations and bringing their science and the history of science in both cases to uh, the university. Um, thank you again, gentlemen. And uh, on behalf of the university, uh, we all sincerely appreciate you joining us. Um, that concludes our, uh, our symposium uh, for this year. I hope everyone enjoyed it and thank you for coming and have a wonderful day.